Hello, my name is Gail Ferguson. I'm an associate professor in the Institute of Child Development at the University of Minnesota, where I direct the Culture and Family Life Lab. It's my honor to be invited to deliver this keynote on remote acculturation remotely. I want to send sincere condolences and solidarity to those among us who are still dealing with the fallout of the global pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. I wish health and resilience for all of us. One silver lining of this pandemic is that it's afforded everyone an instant portal into all things remote. So you can easily think to your own life and your own experiences as we dive into remote acculturation. The title of our keynote today is Remote Acculturation, so far in so little time, even further to go. To get started, I always like to acknowledge the cloud of collaborators and partners who have made the work possible that I'm about to share. And so here is my lab at the University of Minnesota. Um, I also want to acknowledge funders and affiliates and collaborators all around the US and globally, especially the partner schools and families um, who have given up their time and helped us to understand a really interesting and I think important phenomenon. First things first, first let's start with some definitions. I think of acculturation as what happens when groups of individuals from different cultures come into contact, whether continuous or intermittent contact, whether firsthand or indirect contact, with subsequent changes in the original culture patterns of one or more parties. You will recognize this to be um, an adaptation of a classic definition that tends to still be used in the field. Remote acculturation, then, is a form of acculturation that's linked to modern globalization, resulting from indirect and or intermittent contact with a distant, non-native culture. And it contrasts with proximal acculturation, which is the traditional form of acculturation um, that many of us in IACCP study in immigrant receiving contexts. And this type of acculturation requires direct or continuous intercultural contact. So we may all start to experience a little more remote acculturation at IACCP 2020 plus virtual because we're all connecting virtually. You might have interactions with new colleagues and want to follow up on those um, after the conference and hence experience more remote acculturation to their cultural group if you're not native to it. Or you might get fed up with all of this remote stuff and decide you're going to make a physical trip to visit a colleague this fall, someone who you would have seen every two years. It is a brief intermittent visit, not traditional or proximal acculturation. We would also consider that remote acculturation. If you think more pictorially, one way to think about it is that globalization is happening. We all agree. It's this worldwide multi-directional flow of people, goods, and ideas. But when you think about it, uh, proximal acculturation really only focuses on people which is what happens to that person who is now experiencing culture A because someone moved from culture A into their locale. Remote acculturation has to do with all the other forms of culture that are being shared via globalization. In this keynote, what I'd like to do is describe the development of remote acculturation theory and research over the past decade. Remote acculturation is only just about a decade old. We'll talk about a short history and three phases of remote acculturation scholarship in this decade. Then I'd like to cast a vision for the future of RA scholarship, uh, which I call remote acculturation, RA for short. I will propose to deepen the synergy with proximal acculturation scholarship and to harness the power of remote acculturation for prevention. Let's start with the short history of remote acculturation. It was 2009. And I had started a study called the Culture and Family Life Study. The intent was to investigate the proximal acculturation of Jamaican immigrants in the United States. And um, a sample was collected on the island in the Caribbean for a comparison sample. So the story of remote acculturation is really the story of when your comparison sample steals the show. It was a very difficult data collection because of many of the common challenges um, of seeking trust and uh, not living in the community that you're hoping to study. And even if you're a cultural insider, as I was, I'm a Jamaican immigrant myself, um, data collection was very challenging in the immigrant group, but it was not challenging on the island in the same way. 
And I ended up with close to 300 dyads, that's adolescents and mothers. Um, and then it was time to um, think, I got to thinking. And um, before uh, looking into the data, I began to think about acculturation theory, acculturation experiences, and my own experiences growing up in Jamaica. And um, in reflecting on my own life, it became clear, why wouldn't acculturation theory predict the same kinds of experiences for people on the island exposed to a lot of US culture from there, just remotely through media, through tourism, through transnationalism, et cetera. And so this is also the story of how me search can enhance your research. Um, remote acculturation was officially introduced to the, to the field, to, to the literature um, at IS, ISSBD 2010, which was in Zambia at the time. That was the first presentation of it. Now, the lineage of remote acculturation also bears mention. I think of remote acculturation and proximal acculturation as siblings in the cultural transmission family. They have some distinct and shared characteristics. What I have here is an image that I really like um, from Professor John Berry's work, which just depicts a cultural transmission process. On the right, you have an exposure to culture B, which we think of as acculturation. And um, what you can see is that the remote acculturation process is parallel. It uses some of the same, uh, there are some similarities. And so in red arrows, you can be exposed to a distant culture remotely um, via coming from uh, adults in the remote culture. Um, let's say that you're using media or you're connecting to them some other way. Um, adults can communicate with each other and have that intercultural contact. You can experience it from a parent or a grandparent, although it's more likely, this more bold arrow, that you will, if you are the youth, um, be passing on that culture to parents. And then the boldest arrow is really the horizontal transmission, peer to peer. Think about social media, um, think about uh, tourism, think about various other paths, but media really has been the strongest path. For those who are thinking closely, you will notice that there is this left side where remote enculturation can occur, but that's for another keynote. Here are some of the unique characteristics of remote acculturation. There are four T's that were identified in a paper led by uh, Lauren Eels, a doctoral student at the Institute of Child Development. And um, these are vehicles of remote acculturation. There's trade, like food and goods, technology, like general media, music, television, tourism, the visiting of tourists to a local, um, a local environment where the locals are the ones who experience remote acculturation mostly. Um, and then transnationalism where you have transnational populations where people living in another, those who have emigrated come back or they stay in touch um, in either constant touch, but remotely, or they visit periodically. And so it effectuates in the remote acculturation of family and friends in the local community. But there are other also shared uh, components uh, between RA and PA, shared components in this lineage, in this family. One is uh, the dimensionality of remote acculturation. Remote acculturation, um, up, it upholds this tenet that there are multiple dimensions of cultural experience that can happen simultaneously. They are not, it's not a zero sum process. So that is one foundational aspect. And this can happen bidimensionally. It can also happen tridimensionally or multidimensionality, um, multidimensionally. So in other words, um, a person isn't limited to two cultural affiliations. In my work in uh, black immigrants in the United States and um, with uh, black youth and families who are remotely acculturating elsewhere, I tend to use a tridimensional framework when they are acculturating to US cultures to recognize the European American mainstream and the African American culture. There is also the concept of domain differentiation, meaning that acculturation can proceed differently in different domains of life. And um, remote acculturation also abides by or it it does support the ABCD model of a Professor Ward and Dr. Zabo. And um, with this, we're talking about attitudes, 
um, an affect like the stress of globalization and person environment fit, that being important. Behavior, um, this is a really strong component. Remote cultural learning is very important to remote acculturation. Cognition, exploration of identity and development is a very strong develop developmental lens that um, is important in remote acculturation because it is a pretty youth, um, it is a, it, it's a phenomenon that's very common among youth, more common. And then finally, in terms of the lineage and the foundational acculturation theories, I think of polycultural psychology and the idea that cultural affiliations are both plural, so you can have many, as I've said before, and partial. You don't need to absorb and adopt every element of culture, not even your own culture, in order to be considered to have an affiliation or to be acculturating. Now, where does RA fit within the larger study of cultural globalization and cross-cultural psychology? Well, remote acculturation's primary contribution lies in elucidating individual level differences in acculturation towards specific remote cultures. Therefore, it is somewhat distinct from some other members of the family of cultural transmission, like cultural diffusion, which encompasses many levels of analysis, the theory of social change, which tends to focus on the society and community level, although it then corresponds to the individual level. Contextual developmental tradition, which tends to focus on the community level and globalization-based acculturation, which tends to look at global culture, broadly speaking. There are three phases of scholarship that have happened in just about a decade. Um, remote acculturation scholarship has grown fairly rapidly, and that's because it has adapted um, theory and methods from proximal acculturation. This is one of my arguments that you'll hear throughout the keynote is that there are overwhelming parallelisms that we really should be exploiting for the good of acculturation cycle. These three phases are staggered and interlocking rather than um, mutually exclusive um, and stair-stepping, they are staggered. So the first phase was laying the foundation through a focused documentation in the Caribbean region only. The second phase, which began around 2015 and is ongoing, um, was going wider and deeper across regions and across time and into health implications. And the third phase, which is mo the most recent and is ongoing, the goals were scaling and extending remote acculturation interventions. Let's take them one. For the first phase, the features were documenting the presence of remote acculturation and correlates in Jamaica and the Caribbean, a region that has a really strong um, remote connection to the United States. Jamaica has not had any historical connection or political connection, although some other countries in, in the Caribbean have had a connection to the US. This phase was basic descriptive unidisciplinary research. It favored an, uh, an emic lens because I, as the Caribbean born PI was doing research in my own country and in my own region. So I was an insider to that culture. Um, it was single culture studies or comparative cross-cultural studies, such as a transnational comparison between Caribbean people in the islands and Caribbean people in the United States. Both qualitative and quantitative and, um, approaches were used to the research. Here is the region um, where the United States is just north and you have this basin and there is Jamaica in the middle. Again, it's been separate geographically and historically from the United States, which is a strong test of remote acculturation. We have since looked at remote acculturation in nations that are not completely historically distinct. Um, however, it did start with this strong test. So there are many cultural influences that are remote um, and here are some of them, but the United States has had the strongest influence on Jamaica in terms of media influx, in terms of migration patterns, um, and currently in terms of um, the number, the sheer number of immigrants from Jamaica living in the United States, and so a lot of transnational communication. The inaugural paper on remote acculturation was published in 2012 in the, in, in the International Journal of Behavioral Development, and this came out of a sequential explanatory mixed method study called the culture and family life study. And as mentioned, remote acculturation work um, has adopted many measurement methods from proximal acculturation and um, self-report skills is one of them. This is an intrapsychic uh, phenomenon. And so having individuals report 
on their own cultural affiliations, their own identity, their own values is a very valuable and um, necessary approach and valid for the intrapsychic experience. And so measures like the ARSJA adapted from the ARSMA, the acculturation rating scale for Mexican Americans adapted to Jamaican Americans. Um, and then I've just highlighted some of the identity items here. The language identity and behavior scale by um, Dr. Dina Bierman is another one that we've used in this research. Now from that study, the initial study, what we found was that one in three adolescents in this sample and one in 10 mothers had a remotely integrated profile. And that's what's depicted here. They, uh, using cluster analyses and inputting eight acculturation indicators, which included um, behavioral acculturation, family values, and also some identity items, we found that this cluster, which I called Americanized Jamaicans, had higher European American orientation. They had somewhat lower Jamaican orientation in one study, but equal in another. What was interesting is that they had lower family obligations um, considered to be this traditional sense of family values and the level of family obligations that they showed in this study was equal to European Americans, showing that they were not distinguishable from the culture to which they were acculturating. They had larger discrepancies in family values um, between them set between youth and parents, and that discrepancy in acculturation was related to more conflict between youth and parents. And so that was the profile, the original profile of remotely acculturating youth in Jamaica. Qualitatively, we have assessed remote acculturation and especially this um, remote integration um, in a variety of ways. And so one has been to use um, identity maps, which is uh, was taken from the work of Dr. Selchuk Surin and Michelle Fine at NYU. And um, it basically says, here's a piece of paper, here are some materials, draw um, a picture of how you see yourself culturally, all your cultural and social identities. And here is a depiction of a 17 year old boy in Jamaica. He has a shape of Jamaica roughly, one half is American, one half is Jamaican, the Jamaican side. You have dance, food, music, dressing, hard working. The American side has opportunity and education and television. And then there are certain features which are on the borderline like skin color and the way you speak. You can speak standard English or you can speak a dialect. Here is another representation. You see half of the Jamaican flag, half of the US flag. It's inverted, Never mind that. These are adolescents um, under pressure. Um, being recorded during a focus group. And then you see various kinds of music from Jamaica and from the United States. And here is a third, um, another Americanized Jamaican, and he has language, sports, TV shows from both, both countries somehow being incorporated. Compare that to these identity maps of culturally traditional Jamaican youth. Very simple. Again, it's the island of Jamaica, but one big Jamaican flag. A very clear picture of a cultural simplicity, but a very strong cultural pride and identity. This person, peace, I love to bring peace, very simple. And this one, a little more complex on the face of it, but very strong cultural pride. I see myself as a beautiful Jamaican. Also, I'm culturally active. I like the way I dance, the type of music I listen to, sports I play. I view my Jamaican culture as the best culture in the world. Very strong cultural pride. And the flag is there again. Now we've seen remote acculturation in phase one at both the individual level and the societal level, although we focus more on the individual level. Um, one adolescent says, my culture, I don't know. My body's in Jamaica, but my mind is in America. And it really brings home the construct for you. A mother says at the societal level, Jamaican culture is changing. We're embracing more of an American way of life. Now, we also investigated cultural controls in remote acculturation because an obvious question would be, well, how could you be living in one place and really understand the culture of another place so much that you start to acculturate? Um, and so we used focus groups to get at how youth were really seeing and understanding. What we found is that the cultural controls of the remote culture and the local culture were very much determined or influenced by media portrayals and media culture. So, um, teenagers in Jamaica construed U.S. culture and U.S. teens based on Hollywood film images as wild, spoiled white youth with permissive parenting. And so it really was um, European American white youth that they saw as Americans. So they said, for example, 99% of Americans are very spoiled. 
Everybody know that. Uh, or like um, you see people skydiving and bungee jumping and all these things. Yeah, I mean, they just take more, more risks with their lives. Maybe it's because I don't really interact with them personally, but seeing them on television, there are just so many shows with true life stories. You know, they, that's how they actually are in the home. So they realized that there was some stereotypical portrayal, but they found things really compelling, especially reality TV. Um, and Control of Jamaican Teens uh, and Culture came from dance hall music culture. Fun loving, fashion loving, but also tough. They saw the culture as resilient and macho, also anti-gay, and they saw very restrictive parenting. And here is a quote. Jamaicans overall are fighters. And that's what makes us Jamaicans cause of like the history we're coming from. Jamaicans always fighting, um, trying to elevate themselves, you know, push. Cause you know, they don't really have, Jamaicans barely have anything. Most of us are poverty stricken. So they always have to be fighting and trying to elevate themselves. In terms of restrictive parenting, one teenager said this. If like we go somewhere, miss, she go want me go with her. But if me go somewhere now, she not go want me go out. She not want me go out. So this is a teenage boy who really wants to be going out with friends and is lamenting how his mother wants to hang on to him. That she wants to go everywhere with him and won't let him have the autonomy of going out on his own. We also came upon some barriers to remote acculturation in this phase where there was negligible remote cultural orientation in rural settings like in rural Haiti. However, the remote cultural orientation was related to their exposure to US tourists or US fast food that they would consume. So what did we learn from phase one altogether? That remote acculturation is possible to US cultures and not for non-migrants in a monocultural setting like what we had seen in the Caribbean. Remote separation is most common and remote integration afterwards. Remote orientation, um, remote cultural orientation resembles a proximal remote, uh, sorry, um, so RA resembles PA is what I'm trying to say. So if you look at the actual means of the level of orientation, they are similar, although the remote cultural orientation means are weaker. Remote cultural orientation is more common among youth. It's somewhat more elective. So think about coming from media versus you're getting it at school where you must go, which would be the case in PA. Um, it can be towards a mainstream culture. And like I said, the controls are stereotypical and heavily media based, both for the remote culture and the local culture. It's associated with family dynamics in the Caribbean and there was real utility in the emic lens and the cultural insider status because it allowed me to be alert to um, various uh, cultural mores or cultural understandings that were really important to, to document. So for example, the, the type of parenting also the, the gender-based and, and sexuality-based attitudes. The strengths of, the, of this phase were richness in sequential exploratory mixed methods design. Um, multiple acculturated domains were assessed. There was strong regional understanding. There were many limitations though, like uh, cross-sectional research, snapshot methods, uh, measuring acculturation indicators, but not acculturation processes or dynamics. So the second phase of research intended to improve upon that by going wider, deeper, and into health. These were replications and extensions, although Jamaica has remained the innovation hub. New contexts were explored and an, an ethic lens was added whereby um, I no longer had experience in these cultures. So I was a cultural outsider while, while collaborating to do some of this research. We explored associations with health and used inter, an intergenerational lens to get a sense of mechanisms and processes in the home we used applied methodologies cross disciplinary, multi method, experimental, longitudinal case studies. So there was a lot of methodological diversity in this phase. And there was translation into preventive intervention to foster positive adaptation among remotely acculturating families. Um, in order to see the spread and what it meant to go wider and look at remote acculturation, um, there is a recent article, a 2020 article in ORPC led by Lauren Eels at the University of Minnesota. And um, what this is, is a primer I really recommend it. Please go check it out if you're trying to just get a handle on all the literature. And one of the neat things about this paper is we included a lot of graphics. And here you have remote culture flows from the remote culture out to other um, locations. And you can see here what's depicted is 
flows from North America and the Caribbean to the rest of the world. Lots of arrows. Um, we have a research article, so research data in black, and what you see here is green. What was really unique about this article is we partnered with local secondary school educators around the world and uh, across several continents, and they had real world accounts of what they've seen in their students, and so that's indicated in green here. That's indicated in purple, the real world accounts from the educators, and then in black, we have European remote flows to other places in the research. Here we have brown real world accounts from other places, from Africa, from Asia, from South America, remote cultures flowing outwards to other places. So it just gives you a snapshot of where the flows are. This paper also has really nice table of assets and liabilities based on research and based on the real world classroom accounts. I won't go through them, but you can see some of the assets that we've seen are in education, behavior and values, global connections and cultural competence. Whereas liabilities in health and well-being, certain kinds of behaviors and values, attitudes towards the home culture and the remote culture, and certain aspects of cultural connections and identity. I want to spotlight a few um, papers, a few research studies from which we learned important things. So we investigated remote acculturation to South Africa with my colleague, Professor Byron Adams, and um, it's a very different context from Jamaica, highly multicultural, very complex, fairly recently post-apartheid. And, um, and so you had this new generation of young people growing up who had never experienced apartheid. We found very um, interesting uh, remote integration whereby almost three quarters of the sample was remotely integrated as compared to 33% in Jamaica. And um, they were complex. So some were remotely integrated towards African-American culture, others towards European-American culture, and others had a mix. And it was related to well-being. And so the European-Americanized South Africans um, had higher life satisfaction, whereas the African-Americanized South Africans had um, higher psychological distress. And this is after controlling for race and SES. And so there may be something about the particular remote culture you choose to remotely acculturate towards that may either connect to your own experience or may meet a need. And so this attitude function theory started to come to our awareness at that point. In Malawi, we um, explored remote acculturation to three remote cultures, finding that um, was multidimensional. And so here we have a westernized multicultural group where we've got um, high orientation to British culture, American culture, Malawian culture, and South African culture, okay, but a low, low family obligations and um, low on an interdependent self. For the first time, we had an assimilated, a British assimilated group, okay, so this was a group that um, was actually fairly high on their British orientation, but lower on all of the other cultural orientations. Um, and what we found is that the two groups that had strong remote cultural orientation had higher autonomy support from their parents. We also saw remote acculturation in Turkey. And here we found what was interesting is that a parent-parent remote acculturation gap was adaptive for children. And so for mothers who were Ameriturks, so very strong US cultural orientation, when they were paired with fathers who had um, strong Turkish orientation, their children had lower, uh, significantly lower levels of social withdrawal. So they were doing better socio-emotionally. Now, questions started to come about, well, what is remote acculturation? Is it neocolonialism? So it's, it's very easy for the US to kind of infiltrate other places. And so I turned the tables by looking at remote acculturation to Jamaican culture through reggae music, working with Professor Diana Bohr and a host of other collaborators who you may all know from IACCP. One of the reasons I love IACCP. What we found was that reggae music um, may reinforce openness to change values. We found that that was the Schwartz value that was most strongly associated with reggae preference across all of the 
the cultures. And so that was a culture universal, it seemed. Uh, but there were some culture-specific values associated with reggae, like self-enhancement in certain global South cultures, but self-transcendence in other global North cultures where they weren't struggling for um, enhancement, but rather reaching towards brotherhood and social justice. So again, this idea of really um, attitudes meeting needs and there being function to attitudes. We also found that cultural proximity and geographical proximity both facilitated similarities in the values that were associated with reggae. Um, and I note that this is similar in the proximal acculturation literature where the lower the cultural distance, the more um, new culture engagement there is. We also looked at how stable remote acculturation was over time. If it is this sort of less deep, less strong form of acculturation compared to proximal, then how much uh, does it vary over time? And so there, was, um, there were eight longitudinal case studies, three time points of data collection over two years um, in Jamaica. And um, what I found was that six of those eight, so around 75%, retained their remote acculturation status, either an Americanized Jamaican or traditional Jamaican, whereas um, two of them, or 25% of them, swapped okay, their status. But overall, we see that the local culture orientation tends to vary less. It tends to be more stable, um, whereas the remote culture orientation is twice as variable. We also find that for remotely um, separated youth, okay, so that's those with a strong local orientation only, um, they don't have uh, as nearly as much variation in any of their cultural orientations, whereas the remotely integrated youth, the Americanized Jamaicans, they have a, twice as much variability in both of their cultural orientations. There are also intergenerational findings um, whereby mothers are having to respond to remote acculturation and they can either use resistance or selective adoption. Here is an image of a mother who is importing some things from TV shows, TV shows, but then local things remain like ensuring she meets um, parents of friends and that she has positive role models for her son. Interdisciplinary research then grew because we started to notice these associations between remote acculturation and um, media use and diet. And so we did a study on this, collaborated with Professor Julie Meeks in Jamaica, and then did um, some research in the area of uh, media and advertising to try to understand the local context more in terms of what forms of um, US media were being incorporated into the local context. Um, here are two colleagues with whom I've been working on this, Dr. Michelle Nelson, Dr. Regina Ahn, and doing content analyses and non-participant observations in Jamaica. We took the time to map the context. What we found is that a lot of fast food ads had um, either international packaging or they were localized, as you can see. So we got Pepsi on a beach with a lot of smiles. We've got Kentucky Fried Chicken linked to a national examination for sixth graders. So when they passed, this is an ad in a newspaper, come and get a big deal of chicken. And then we have other chicken being advertised. Um, dinner just got easier. So making life very convenient for everyone. And so understanding this, it made me think about media literacy. Clearly media was a prominent vehicle. Um, and so the question was, how could we intervene? Improving critical thinking about media could be one way, and we found that indeed um, individuals who had higher media enjoyment um, were not putting as much effort into reducing fat in their diet unless they had high media literacy or unless their mother did or their partner in the family. And so media literacy was an effective or it could be a buffer. We then created the Just Media program food, uh, food based media literacy, media literacy program for adolescents and mothers, which includes workshops and text messaging. And um, we published this, the process of creating it and the efficacy study. And um, we had we did an RCT in Jamaica randomized control trial with seventh graders, where we compared the workshop and the workshop plus texting to a control group across five months. And what was interesting here is we used remote culture orientation as the inclusion criterion. 
we were not intending to change remote acculturation, but rather knowing that it was a risk factor, what I think of as a cultural determinant of health, we used it to figure out who to target for the intervention. We found that the intervention improved eating vegetables, cooked vegetables by the end of the intervention, and it also improved media literacy. And so the blue line is the control group for each. And what we see here is that um, those individuals who receive text messages, mothers in particular, it extended the gains of the intervention. And these were medium effects, so they were not to laugh at. So what do we learn from phase two? Remote acculturation occurs in multiple world regions. It occurs to non-US non remote cultures are involved, so it's not neocolonialism. Remote integration and separation seem to be universals, but remote assimilation can occur. It's culturally specific. It occurs in multicultural settings. It's multidimensional. It can actually be stronger than proximal acculturation, which we found in South Africa. The remote target culture can be a minority culture. It is eco-cultural. It's associated with mental health, family dynamics, and nutrition. It can be used to target interventions, and the health risks associated with remote acculturation can be mitigated. The utility of the etic lens and the cultural outsider status was also learning for us. So this phase was really strengthened by the richness in the large cross-cultural designs. We could answer specific critiques. And um, remote acculturation really emerged as a cultural determinant of health. We were able to translate to intervention and incorporate experimental data. Limitation is we were still limited to one region focused on Jamaica and the Caribbean. And we really had to back burner the benefits of remote acculturation at this point. Phase three of remote acculturation was scaling the preventive interventions and we're still working on this actively um, using digitization and cultural adaptation. Um, and so we animated and then have been culturally adapting the Just Media program. It was very community engaged and we've used a cross-cultural team science approach. So in terms of digitizing to Just Media, we really have looked at a globalization-based solution for a globalization-based problem. Given that media is a primary vehicle of remote acculturation, um, looking at media literacy as a primary tool makes a lot of sense. And so um, Sarah Gillespie, who's at top, and Sarah Eckersdorfer in the Culture and Family Life Lab with me, and then a consultant, Aaron Anderson in Jamaica, who's a curriculum and education expert, we have digitized it. I have just a quick sample for you. And I want you to see the characters. I want you to listen to the voices and um, just get a taste. One impact of US culture spread is that some youth and parents in cities around the world are internalizing American culture through a process called remote acculturation. When we interviewed youth and mothers in Kingston, this is what they told us. Jamaican culture is changing. We are embracing more of the American way of life. My culture, I don't know. My body is in Jamaica, but my mind is in America. Kingston students named this new identity a mixed culture person or a Jamaican. So you should recognize my voice, but you are also hearing a teen actor who we had from the local culture. Then the next step was to culturally adapt. And so we've really looked at digitizing and then using storyboards, which is what you see depicted here as a blueprint for then making uh, smooth cultural adaptations to a second culture. This has been led by Tori Simonek, who is a PhD student um, in the lab. And um, we've been able to go from the RA model to a PA model using the tridimensional acculturation model because we're extending it to Jamaican immigrants in the United States and Somali uh, refugees. And so one of the adaptations, we have both surface level and deep level adaptations. One of the adaptations for nutrition curriculum is adapting to the month of Ramadan and how to make those recommendations. And so in our team, we have Somali Americans like this undergraduate student, Salma Ibrahim. And we also have um, a, a medical doctor, Dr. Duvedi, who is at a community health center affiliated with the university who works with a large sample of refugees, including Muslim Americans. So what are we learning in phase three? Embrace technology. We must fight fire with fire. RA is compatible with PA and it makes the adaptation straightforward. 
really need to integrate these emic and etic perspectives and RA has really innovated transdisciplinary science. We're gonna be looking at acceptability and the efficacy of these digital interventions and the feasibility and acceptability of scaling it to immigrant and refugee populations in the United States and um, after in other places. Lots of strengths, creative explosion. If there wasn't enough creativity in remote acculturation to begin with, it's exploded now. A lot of involvement by undergraduate researchers um, in this phase. The blueprint storyboard that we created really facilitates cultural adaptations. And I just want to recommend anyone who's really interested in that process. There's a talk by Sarah Gillespie and Tori Simonek. Um, and so look for their names in the program so that you can go and check out their talk and discussion. This phase has also been resilient to pandemic setbacks because although the pandemic impacted data collection in, an, in other studies, it did not really impact the digitization work, um, nor would it have impacted the rollout if we were at that stage. The limitation though, is that translational, transdisciplinary, cross-cultural team science is slow science, but we're hoping for a payoff in scaling and impact later. A lot has been done in a decade. Um, and we're very proud of that work and have really enjoyed it. It's been exciting. What's the vision for the future? I have a vision that's twofold. One is to, the first part is to deepen the synergy with proximal acculturation. And the second part is, is to harness the power of remote acculturation for prevention. So deeper interlocution between RA and PA scholarship, I believe is in the best interest of acculturation psychology. It is in the interest of its survival and of its relevance for the future. Theoretically speaking, RA could be a purer test of some of the implications of intercultural contact without confounding immigration related hassles, which happens in proximal acculturation. For example, what are the universal aspects of biculturalism and multiculturalism across RA and PA? Okay, we have one paper that looks at some universal benefits, but some unique liabilities. This has implications for those who study BII and MII bicultural identity integration and multicultural identity integration. Many of us do that. Universal acculturation conditions could also be re-examined. So for example, discrimination has been thought of as a core acculturation condition for proximal acculturation, but it's much less relevant in a remote acculturation context. So is it really central or is, are there other things, global events that will be stronger universal conditions for acculturation like the global pandemic? It's impacting immigrants and non-immigrants um, in very large ways. And so let's think creatively and expansively about theory. RA and PA theories are compatible and they really can provide a firm theoretical base for future research and intervention. Methodologically speaking, we need to realize that modern youth in diverse societies, including immigrants, are often engaged in both proximal and remote cultures simultaneously. So the future study of multiculturalism research must include proximal acculturation and remote acculturation. It will no longer be acceptable to only study one or the other because it will not map onto the real lives of youth. Uh, we know already that RA and PA exist in non-migrants. We saw that in South Africa. We, know, we are finding out that RA and PA are experienced by immigrant and refugee youth. I have a study underway in my lab, which um, is looking at that amongst other things. And we also see that as majority eclipses, um, sorry, as minority eclipses majority in a lot of diverse societies, majority youth are now struggling with their sense of belonging and that may increase their need um, to seek out remote acculturation. We also know that RA and PA have largely shared research methods. And so this is not a big leap to start um, intertwining the two in our research studies and they are compatible in informing interventions and they can facilitate smooth transnational or diasporic scaling. The two areas also share many growth initiatives um, like deeper ecological contextualization is a call from both areas, diversified measurement and methodologies, um, looking more at the dynamics of acculturation, interdisciplinarity is a call from both, and deeper integration with developmental science. Those are shared initiatives in both RA and PA, which I think um, move for the stronger synergy between the two. The second um, future way forward, I think, is to harness the power of remote acculturation for prevention and intervention. So remote acculturation is a cultural determinant of, of health is one of the things I've tried to convince you of in this keynote. And so adding re remote acculturation to global health studies can enhance the risk profile 
um, of youth or adults, adding remote acculturation to mainstream US culture um, as an inclusion criterion, along with other health risk factors can help you target interventions for global youth. Utilizing remote acculturation theory and intervention design can help you better understand and account for the motivations people have and what will impact their behavior change. For example, ignoring that remote acculturation to US culture is happening is gonna be foolish in nutrition programs because I've already demonstrated that it plays a role. Um, and ignoring remote acculturation to African-American culture or Jamaican culture, if you're trying to do a resilience promoting intervention for black youth in the African diaspora, you may be missing a source of empowerment. Um, we don't have data on that yet, but that would be really um, interesting to go in that direction. Using remote acculturation to target interventions is therefore cost effective. Uh, this is something that um, prevention science, um, you know, looks at and certainly economists are very interested in and governments is how can you get the best bang for the book and um, prevention is one of those ways, but certainly if you can target interventions better that's one of the ways to go. So thank you very much for your time. I look forward to the uh, discussion um, later on in the program and I'm wishing you well on your own remote acculturation journeys.